Hi there, I'm Misha, the head of marketing for Monte Carlo, and you've joined us today at the Data Downtime Show. Today, we are be interviewing Maria Villar, who has 25 years of experience as a chief data officer, responsible for building enterprise data management organizations from the ground up and leading the culture change across the enterprise. She's held positions in both technology and the financial sector, and most recently at SAP, when she was their chief data officer from 2009 to 2017. Today, Maria is Head of Enterprise Data Strategy and Transformation at SAP, where she advises SAP's customers on the crucial role of data management in their digital transformation, leveraging practical operational experience as a CDO. All right, Maria, thank you so much for joining us today at the Data Downtime Show. Um, we, You and I met a, a few months ago, like the very first week that I started working at Monte Carlo, and I was so inspired by you, and I think you'd be Awesome. I knew you would be awesome for, for today. So really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. It's very flattering. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, just, uh, you know, the, the viewers already have um, your bio and I shared a little bit with them your background already, but um, I, what they might not know is how did you first get interested in data? I'd love to hear more about your background that led you to becoming you know, chief data officer at SAP and a data executive at several uh, notable companies like IBM and, and Fannie Mae. Yeah, so, so my journey started pretty early. Uh, when I graduated from college with an undergrad in computer science, I joined IBM. Um, but I joined it on the product development side, software product development side. So I was actually a developer for a while, got into management there, and um, really felt that I could be a better leader and a developer if I understood how customers use our products and then sort of bring it back into the product, um, into the product portfolio. So I took an internal job in IT. Uh, thinking that that because we all use uh, at, uh, at IBM products at the time that it would give me a really good perspective on how, how customers use our products and then I would bring it back to the product development side and and really introduce it to our products but you know that never happened once I went over to internal IT mm -hmm. I pretty much stayed there until I left I IBM and it was there that I got my first job in data um, so I was a manager at the time, and I was asked to take over a customer data management project, which is actually a, a, a project that was in deep trouble. Uh, they had It was associated with the CRM deployment that we had had, and the CRM deployment did not go as planned because of the data. So they asked me to take over this master data project and to get it back on track, and um, we did that. And we got a lot of kudos from that. And we also became very clear that um, the way we were managing customer data was the way that we should be managing other kinds of data. And so the organization grew from just customer data to all the other master data in the in the company, product data, employee data. Um, and not only on the development side, but I had the whole team. Uh, so I had great experience. I had, the data, the business side, the data stewards, I had the IT team, I had the operations team, and we even had analytics at the time. So wow. it was a wow. really big organization. It was probably the, of course, we didn't call it chief data officer at the time. That was 20 years ago. We didn't use that title, but it was the head of data, the most senior executive. I reported into the CIO at the time. And it was there really that I started to get this passion for data because I feel it's it's the language of business. I also went back to school and got my MBA. Uh, so this marriage of the business and IT, which is what I think data is, it's that bridge between business process and applications. And it's an underserved area. And I love uh, working for underdogs. So it was underserved, misunderstood, and it was a big challenge for me. And that's how I really started on it. With data, it's um, a, a cross between business processes and applications. That's, it. that's exactly what it is. It's so, uh, I, I love the way that you put that. Um, well, I'd love to fast forward a little bit and hear about what you've been working on at, at SAP. Uh, I know you've been there for, for quite some time. Um, and years now. And I, again, it's one of those jobs that I said, well, I'll do that, this for a couple of, a little bit about my transition, by the way. Yeah. So when I was at IBM, I was there really that head of data job for about five or six years. And I made a conscious decision in my career that 
either I was going to stay with IBM and be broad in my experience. So, okay, I'll do data for a while and then I'll go back to development and then maybe do, do something else or made a decision that I wanted to be a data professional and how do I become a better data professional? And so I made the second decision to say, okay, I want to stay in this space and how do we, how do I become more experienced? I can either I leave the company and do it in other industries and other organizations and other companies. Uh, and that's what I did. I made that choice. So I, I wanted to stay in this profession, but go broader in terms of industry expertise. And, um, and that's how I first got to Fannie Mae. So, you know, Fannie Mae and financial services was completely different than, than certainly IBM, uh, both positive and negative, right? Culture wise and others. Mm-hmm. And um, as well, so really continuing to broaden my experience around data and the mission and the culture and doing it for different companies. And then I, I landed in at, um, at SAP 10 years ago, again, because they had had an issue with one of their M&As, um, mm-hmm. a lot of customer data issues, uh, wanted to start a data program. So I was hired in to start the data program from the ground up and continued to do it for seven years. And those seven years were great. I built the organization, had great sponsorship, showed business value of over 75 million euro. Of course, we're you know European company, so it was euro. Uh, five industry awards. Really great, great experience. Learning from my other two experiences, where hey, I did some things great, and I also did some things not so great that I had to learn from. Um, and so that's what I did for seven years. But after seven years, I said, okay, I'm going to do something else, but I want to stay in this space. And now I've got the best job at SAP and I get to work with customers. I've been doing that for the last three years, um, really advising them, senior level, several executives on this topic of data, data management, data strategy, how to do it effectively, um, how to build all the capabilities, not just the technical, because we know certainly SAP knows how to do that, but also the organizational structure, the process, the value metrics, all that. And that's what I've been doing for three years. And it's just a train. Terrific job. I love it. And it sounds like you were at um, very similar to with IBM and uh, SAP that you started out um, data problems were with like customer data and then it ended up being like, hey, we have data issues all across the board um, and they needed someone like you to come in and and, and fix things. Um, what kind yeah. of, yeah. I find once you do it once, um, uh, you, you become very valuable to other companies because it is a very common area to start with. It's so impactful and um, the, and, and, and it's, it's so difficult to do, but there's so many things that are, once you've got that infrastructure, you've got the management system, you've got the organizational structure, it's very reusable to other assets in the company. And that's what we learned when we started at first at IBM. I was a very insightful manager that that worked um, that I worked for at the time that says, "Hey, why don't we just keep adding to to what you're doing, in, instead of trying to build up different organizations?" And, and she was spot on. And, and that really was the first chief data officer uh, at IBM. They they since have they do have a chief data officer now uh, that's been in place for quite a while for probably five, five years or so, but yeah, it started way back then 20 years ago. That's incredible to hear that, that, that history and, and the rich history of, you know, the, the role of chief data officer, um, yeah. in technology. Um, you know, one of the things that really inspires me about your career is just like your rich background in data governance. Um, I'd love to just hear from your perspective, like what is your approach to data governance? Um, and how is that different than what others are doing? Well, first of all, I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, and it's something that I have really studied a lot and practiced it. And one of the first things that I would say is I've learned not to use the word data governance um, <laughs> or, to, <laughs> or to minimize that word data governance. Data governance, that word plays well in regulated industries. So certainly finance maybe or, or government or others and where that, that's probably an established word but in most other companies including the technology ones that i've been in it it puts the business off and it sort of sounds as a guardrail oh you're going to get in my way you're going to be another bureaucrat right you're going to govern uh 
um, you're going to set up all these policies and rules. And so what I've learned is just to me start messaging it from day one differently. So instead of saying I'm going to govern your data, I say, you know, we're going to manage our data to business outcomes. And isn't that what we all want, right? And just by changing the language, it opens up the door. It's, it's not as limiting. I find the word governance is limiting. And the role is really not about, about just governing data. It's managing all the perspectives of data to the outcomes. And, you know, I also find that, again, that business leaders respond more to that word. Think about what we all want is to manage corporate, is to manage data as an enterprise asset. But think about how we talk about other assets in the company. We don't say, well, I'm going to govern my people. I'm going to govern my capital or a co govern my project, right? You never say those words. You say, I'm going to manage them. So, you know, I, I think it, it fits better with how we really want to talk about this topic. So that's the first thing that I, I think differentiates myself and my approach. And the other is always talk about this topic um, as it relates to an outcome. So if you know what the outcome is you're trying to achieve from a business perspective, that outcome then helps you define how you have to govern, right? What standards do you need? What policies? What organizational structure? So it, it really is more about um, learning to start with the outcomes first and then letting that drive you to what you need to do from a data perspective in terms of policies and standards and accountability model. So it's, it's pretty inclusive, but I've also, again, learned to change my own wording on this topic. I, and I don't use the word stewards either. I think that's another one of those terms that I, re I replace with data leaders. So instead of a data steward, it's a data leader. Um, and I find that also business people respond more to that. And if you ask them to be a data steward, mm -hmm. um, that's one reaction. If you ask them to be a data leader, they really view the job a, um, a lot more comprehensively and, and, and a lot better for them. They can actually put it on a resume. Who would have thought that words are that important in, in, a, in a profession that's all about numbers? <laughs> <They're important laughs> um, you should make a, a Maria Villar's dictionary. So, that, yeah. That, uh, yeah. you know, that can be something that you share with, with the whole industry. So everyone knows, like, don't use it in governments. You don't it's, it's, in, it's funny you say that because every time I have a customer meeting, and especially if they have an established organization, and, and right off the bat, they use those, those words that, that I, I have used, I have uh, replaced, and we talk about it right up front. And then, and everyone agrees after they hear it, because they, they hear the rationale, and they also see a reaction over time with, with, with the word. But words matter here. And um, that's one of the things, personally, for me, I've had to learn to be a better salesperson for this topic, because it is... Um, myself that is a salesperson and I heard Kara in your last um, um, uh, webinar and she said the same thing is we data people and especially in these executive positions need to learn how to sell our topic right. uh, and right. use the right words to sell that's so true I think that it's something that you um, that is often um, often overlooked, but and not even just a, about about selling, but is really um, helpful and in, in just educating. Like I can completely see you as a as a professor in data, just showing up the first day of class, writing down data governance, and then just crossing it out and saying use this word instead instead of data steward, cross it out, data leader. Like yeah, and, and, that, and that motivates people because everyone wants to feel like they're part of part of the, this the story uh, to get together the data the data story that brings everything together yeah and I find that, uh, those of us that sort of are attracted to this job um, we are introverts by nature I mean we are zero and one people we're logical right we we <laughs> believe the data tells the story why should we have to do anything else and unfortunately that's not enough so I had to learn to have a voice myself and to be better at communicating with C-levels. And my biggest compliment that I, that I get now when I work with SAP customers, you know, at the C-level, um, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, right? Not just the CIOs. Um, the most interesting compliment that I get what is when someone says, you know, this is the most interesting conversation I've ever had about data. Like, <laughs> Great. 
That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to keep your interest, right? I wanted to make sure I wasn't, uh, uh, I was really relaying the importance in a way that you could connect to. And that's, that's a great compliment. That made my day. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic skill because without being able to communicate what it is you're trying to achieve in data, then people just will gloss right over it. Ones and zeros to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I guess outside of data governance, (laughs) um, what's a priority that you think data organizations have these days? You're consulting with so many different companies right now. What do you see as um, their, their prior, their priorities? Well, it's certainly changed as a result of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So I would tell you, um, there are some things that are classic um, in terms of priorities, Um, data quality in in Monte Carlo and the space that you're in, that's never gonna go away. That's always important. And it's a problem that we still haven't solved completely. Uh, It is hard and under, uh, under, under misunderstood, a lot of myths around it. So um, I do think data quality management is here to stay, right? It's still important and more important if you're being, if you're going digital, if you want to go real time, if you want to do analytics, I mean, all that stuff, AI, ML, all of that requires good data and data quality management. But what I have seen change is the importance of data literacy. Mm. And I, and I, I just wrote an article, um, I, I mean, maybe we should post it, that is called What COVID-19 Dashboards Have Taught Us About Data Assess- Assess- Assessments. And it's really um, understanding how to read a dashboard uh, has become so much more important inside your business and even in your own personal life and the questions you should be asking yourself that are very data specific, like what are the trusted sources? Mm-hmm. What's the data quality that's been done on this? Uh, what do the definitions mean? When was this data pulled? I mean, some of those basic questions, uh, we, now, we now have to keep uh, educating our executives on. And so to become data driven, and especially in these environments where, where we're gonna have to have more analytics mm-hmm. um, to help us tell the story and to predict the future here, uh, that data literacy is becoming really important. I used to think data literacy and data culture were the same thing. And I do think it's part of changing the data culture because you need to understand the use of data, and data literacy in order to uh, impact the culture. But really just that topic of helping all of the companies understand what are the right questions you should be asking and how do you use this data to make a decision and how you, you don't fall into a trap of using the data in a different way that you shouldn't be using it. Right. And one thing that you said is, you know, make sure that you trust like the sources of that data. How, how, how would one figure out whether something is trusted or not? Well, you got to ask some questions uh, first. And sometimes you don't have answers to that question, but, but I always say a trusted source is a source of data uh, that has an ongoing data quality program to it. Okay. And, and so understanding whether that data comes from a third party or comes internally, sure, you have data in, in this warehouse repository, whatever it is, but what are you doing to, to maintain the currency of that data? Do you, do you have something proactively done? And if you don't, then that data's stale. I, that, that's, that's, you know, question, that's answer and question number one. Right. Uh, so it really is asking that those questions about um, the accountability and the programs that you put in place and how automated are they, and that's how you know that something is trusted. First, it has to come from a you know an institution that you value that you believe is trusted, and then but further you have to ask the question of that institution exactly what are you doing um, to maintain the quality and the accuracy and the timeliness of that data. Right. There's a lot of um, uh, critical critical thinking, I think, that's involved with um, with data, and there's so much response. That's one of the things that I responded to when um, I first heard you speak. Is you know we have a responsibility, um, you know, an accountability for for data. Um, yeah, just be. We are the about. conscience of it in a way. I mean, there again, I, I always say these um, prof- these professional roles. There, there's there's really a, a role that you can play to be that, that voice for, for data. And that's why it's sort of underserved in, in many ways and underrepresented. Although I would have to tell you one of the things that, have, that I have seen that's changed is there's lots of voices now mm-hmm. around data. It used to be it was only the CIO that talked about data. 
But now you've got the CIO, the chief data officer, the chief analytic officer, the chief privacy officer, the chief technology officer, the chief security <laughs> officer. You know, like all of them have a voice, a data voice that's very siloed. Um, and one of the kind of the trends that, that I've been trying to push is, and I see it happening already a little bit, is that we need to partner, all of these data voices should be partnering together to give the business one view of that asset and all of the risk and all the opportunities around one asset. Uh, and we don't need to have five different metadata repositories, one for privacy, one for, right, and are, how many classifications of data do we have? Oh, where is it PII data? Is it is it critical data? Is it, you know, security data? We have these terms that we all use for our own space, but the business then doesn't get a full view of that asset and all of its risk and all its opportunities. So the more we can partner as data voices in the company and have one data strategy. Um, and I'm seeing that. I'm seeing chief privacy officers and chief data officers working more together, chief data officers and chief security officers and the analytics. So it's happening. And I think it would make us more uh, important in uh, to the business if we could consolidate our voices. Um, no, I think that's such a great point. And how do you, I guess, are there some certain organizations that you see that are doing this really well? Um, and how can people learn from those organizations that are being able to bring those voices together? Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I think I see financial services seems to be leading the way um, in some of these areas, especially with privacy and and uh, privacy and the chief data officer for they're working together. I mean, there's some CDOs um, in MasterCard, for example, she's fantastic. And she was first the privacy to officer and now she's the privacy officer and the chief data officer. Certainly those regulated industries seem to go first or the most advanced. Um, that I believe in that, but we're still early in, in the journey. What I also see a lot of chief data officers and chief analytic officers be one role, and that's prevalent. That's happening everywhere. Mm. Um, I just worry about that a little bit when I see those combined roles, because my experience has been is when you put the data team under the under the analytics team, and they're not a peer of the analytics team, Oftentimes, the data team only works on the analytic problems that re related to data. And, you know, data, again, is used by all business processes. And so really, you know, working on, on the process, on all processes, including analytics, right. um, would be more impactful. But sometimes you know, that's, uh, um, I, see, I see those combined roles. And, I, you know, I caution anyone who has that role to just make sure they're just equal in your organization and not down in you know two or three levels from the analytic team. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because every um, when it comes to, to something as important as data, everyone should have a seat at the table and at the same level at the table. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it's hard to things can get buried. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to, you know, what are the capabilities that are important? I think that was a, uh, something else in terms of this program is that you have to have the right organizational structure, you have to have the right set, you have the right strategy to pick the data that matters most um, in this organization. You have to triage your data. And I look, when I do use the word governance, um, I use it when I talk about adaptive governance. Mm. So not all data should be treated the same and, and the head of data, whatever that role is called in your organization, should really triage the data in the company and say, okay, what is the most, important strategic data or shared data that we have to manage in a pretty tops down way and that's what you put in in a more structured program but there's other data in the company that you're going to have to establish the, the the guardrails for and the automation or just leave it un, ungoverned unmanaged at all so you've got to really understand all of those nuances and make those decisions so adaptive governance is a word I do like because it does show flexibility in, in managing the data that matters most, but also understanding what outcomes are important. And then if you want that outcome, what characteristics um, the data has to be managed to. 
very fascinating. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's just so much to, there's just so much there um, that people can really t- take away from that. And th- thank you for pro- providing that insight because I think that's really um, so- something that's key. And a lot of times, it, I mean, it's not, the way that you say it makes it sound so simple. Like, of course, of course we, we should be oh, doing yeah. that. Of course this makes it's sense. So, <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. That process of identifying, everybody wants to say all their data is important. So really understanding and getting that business input Mm-hmm. to the data that materially, I like to use that word, materially impacts the process and the outcome. That's the one that's the top of the list. And then after that, you've got other kinds of data that, you know, maybe you just use automation. That's it. That's, yeah, it's important, but uh, you can do it at the department level or you can use automation mm-hmm. uh, or you just provide guidelines, right? And let uh, the citizens of the organization manage mm-hmm. it on their own with guidelines. That's also, but, you know, making that conscious effort to understand it all. Incredible. Yeah. I, um, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've been thinking about, um, and this kind of like leads into the the next question is, um, how can people take all of these learnings and, um, and apply them to their own, to their own, to their own organizations and uh, I guess I'd just love to hear from you, your perspective is like, how would you, um, what would you do differently um, in your data journey? Like, what's one thing that you said, I think this is really great. I'm so glad that I did it. And then maybe something that you said, eh, I wish I didn't do this. Um, and this is why. So please avoid this pitfall. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. But certainly, I, I, you know, I like to say I've earned my share of badges and scars from having to do this job <laughs> for 20 years. So I would say one of my first recommendations is really when you uh, understand the culture, when you're interviewing for a new position, especially a senior position, like a head of data kind of role like I had. So certainly I was naive um, and not really appreciated that. So IBM was my first job out of college. I stayed there for a very long time. And when I left, sort of, you sort of assume everything is like IBM, cultures like IBM, people are going to be in processes. And that couldn't be more wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and in this topic in particular, the culture makes a difference. And, and so understanding the culture and seeing that if there's a culture fit between yourself and the organization you're going to go to, and also that the job is well vetted out. Since these roles are new, um, and sometimes the first time they're being done in an organization, if they haven't been vetted out at the senior level with the business and IT, and that person comes in new and has to start spending six months uh, defining the role, selling the role, and all of that, and that's very difficult position to be in. And and sometimes it, you know, leads to a discovery that you're not, you don't have the buy-in for the job that you, that you thought you had. So really uh, understanding that in the interview process, understanding who's vetted the job, who's agreed to it, who's going to be your sponsor, um, and what's the culture, um, not just from the interview, but what are people saying outside the interview process? Mm -hmm. And we have great now websites for that, um, Glassdoor and others. Mm -hmm. So that would be one big recommendation. And the other is kind of what we just talked about, learning to speak the language of business and not the language of data. I mean, we could be so geeky, right? (laughs) Metadata, you know, here's another word that that I find fascinating we use. We use deduplication. I said, what, what is that? That means we're removing duplicates. Well, why don't we just say that? I mean, de undo, I mean, it's, still like, it's the worst word that we could possibly have picked for that uh, task. Uh, so, so learning, for me, getting my MBA was tremendously important for me because that really got me hooked on business and business processes and outcomes. The second thing I had to, I did, which was also tremendous for helping me explain myself in this topic was I wrote a book. Um, I wrote a book with Teresa Kirshner back. um, Now it's going to be about 15 years ago. It's called, you know, um, from chaos to confidence. Um, (laughs) And, and it was for business people. And I had a great experience because the publisher really didn't know anything about this topic Mm-hmm. And the first time we sent him a draft, we had spent like six months. We thought it was so great. 
and he just came back to us and said no <laughs> he said you're selling you know you're 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 selling it to totally wrong right mm -hmm. and he made us rewrite a lot of it and reorder it and it just gave me such appreciation for words matter mm -hmm. um, understanding simplifying this topic if he didn't get it then nobody, some other people weren't going to get it. So all of that has helped me come to where I am today, which is to be much more articulate about the topic and to bring it down to a, not, I wouldn't say d dumb it down, but un, un geekify it in a way <laughs> and, and be able to connect it to the business mm -hmm. in a way that I can have a conversation with a CEO or a CFO and they're, you know, their, their eyes are not, are not like tearing over right so um, so that's that's really really important for a data leader to have those communication skills what um, and I'm just I'm so curious about your book um, what what was it that you had written prior that just didn't resonate that had to be changed um, what, what was yeah. that? well I, it was all because all the books that were out there were for IT people, for business people. It was about da you know, da databases or, or it was all technical books. There wasn't a book for business people mm. about what is their role in managing data and what should they know if they, they, they have projects around this that are important that are data, I call them data rich projects for which, which means you can't achieve your outcomes if you don't also manage the data that feeds those those uh, those outcomes. So we really wrote this book for business people only, mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that we we've been thinking about um, really uh, updating it. But a lot of it really still is very current because we never talked about technology in it. It was just about business processes, accountability, um, and selling and culture and all that and so it was the first of its kind. It's still available in, in Amazon, um, but but clearly isn't, you know, it, this, I don't get rich off of that book. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> well, well, maybe you will. Let's link to it. Uh, we'll, okay. we'll link to it too, the book and then also your COVID-19 article that just came out. Yeah, uh, I yeah. would love that. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, and I guess just thinking about, I mean, you've had such a rewarding career, like what are what's the if there was just one overarching maybe it's like a moment or a story where you said this is this is so i'm so happy that i'm doing this um is there something that you can share well i would i would say there's probably two instances of that um <laughs> probably both of which in the last three years so i think i think it, i keep saying i have the best job in the whole wide world but um <laughs> maybe three so the first the first one is um, right after in 2017, right before I took this um, job, I did get uh, recognized by uh, the International Society of Chief Data Officers. So they had their first um, award awards. They had three awards that year for the International Society, and I was one of the recipients. And it was it was a, a reward for uh, transforming the organization and getting that business accountability and business sponsorship. So it was a, it was that class of award and it was really an award for, for me personally, it wasn't an award for SAP. It was in that lead. So being recognized from the, from the society of my peers was, was pretty, pretty, uh, I think impactful for me. Um, then, you know, those customer stories, like I just told you, when I get told by a CXX that, hey, this is the most interesting data conversation I ever had, or um, another story that I can recall where someone said to me, um, you know, this 30-minute meeting has been the most productive meeting of my day, of my week. <laughs> so, I mean, kind of, that, those kind of things really just make my year when I get, when I hear that, because from where I came, from having to really focus on being a better communicator. Um, and then the third is that masterclass. The masterclass, as we were talking about before, right. the, the, we, we, we turned on the video, was, was certainly a personal challenge. Um, I took a risk because I'd never done something like that before and um, didn't know if I could pull it off, frankly. Uh, and when I saw the final product and the reaction that I've gotten to it, 
um, it, it, it's kind of validating that sometimes you do have to take those risks in your career mm-hmm. and it could have gone badly. And here I am out there, 14 videos of me and it's a disaster, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it has been so, um, I, I think rewarding to know that it was, it's used by so many, uh, customers as well as internally at SAP and I even donated it to the International Society so they have it on their link as well and it's been downloaded you know 2,000 times or something it's pretty incredible. I think that's amazing and you know when I look at your career I see like this you know over time it's like this like Venn diagram of sorts where there's like a your data executive, your business executive, and you're like an educator. And it's really cool. I think, and that's what the masterclass really brings out is Absolutely. that in, in all of you, um, that, yeah. that's who you yeah. are. And I think that's also what that award was is saying like, this is someone who's able to co- communicate to both of these audiences in a meaningful way and to be able to present data in a way that people can really transform their organizations the way they want to. Um, yeah. well, anyway, congratulations yeah. on that. I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't know about I, I think I'm a frustrated it. teacher. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think I should have been a teacher in, in a, in, in, <laughs> or maybe in a previous life. You I was, were, but you yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. This is what is so fun about my job is now I get to bring that part of me out and it, just makes me happy to be able to do that. That's great. I'm so I'm so happy for you. Um, and then uh, I had a, I'm looking I'm like looking at my list. What are some of the other questions I have for you? Oh yes, um, this is a question I love asking. Is um, if you could have dinner with like any other CDO or any other data leader in the world, um, who would it be and, and why? I love this question. I love this question because you made me really think about about this. Um, so there's two people, uh, first of all, and uh, you know the first person I want to, I would like to have dinner with is um, is the head of the John Hopkins dashboard, the one that created that dashboard. Her name is Dr. Laura Gartner. She presented at the International Society of Chief Data Officers, and she was fascinating. And I could probably talk to her for hours. But think about that data challenge, mm-hmm. um, the way that she, it had to come together all the sources of data, how, how was it became that credible source for so many individuals in the United States and outside, all the challenges that they had, the politics. I mean, it was an incredible data challenge that, that she and her team stood up for and continue to do. So just getting underneath the covers with that and understanding more of how she did it, what challenges she had, and how she over overcame them, I think would be a fascinating conversation. And then the other one that I would have, and I, I wish I would have had the, uh, the pleasure of it, but I won't, is you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason why, she's not a CDO, but she's a, you know, she's a love, lover of data, right? A, da- a friend of data, because all attorneys, Supreme Court judges, all of those, uh, all of those individuals, they use data as the source of their you know, analysis. But what I liked about her was, her ability to then take that data mm-hmm. and then translate it to do something meaningful and make a case that won people over. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so kind of using the facts and then, and then building that compelling story and, and message and then convincing and, and changing legislation um, at, a time, at a time when that wasn't what women did. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's fascinating also. So data having these great data management skills and, and, and voices, um, being able to kind of use it and articulate it is really can be applied to so many professions. So that would be my, so I'm just a big, you know, RBG fan. <laughs> I love that. I never, right? <laughs> never thought, I never thought I would hear RBG being synonymous with data, but it actually, it, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You to, to be an arbiter of, uh, of some, something really meaningful, you need to be able to present, you know, factual evidence and, and, and data. And it's very cool. Uh, yeah, that you it is. To, to, to draw that. Um, well, Maria, thank you so much for spending the time today. It was just a pleasure as always um, getting to, to chat with you. Um, I guess before we, we, we head out, um, is there anything else that you wanted to share or address? Um, no, I just want to thank you for doing this. Um, again, I think I think it's a great platform, and I've enjoyed working with you, 
working with Monte Carlo. It's, it's a great, you know, it's a, it's a great partnership. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Maria, and we will talk to you soon. Great. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you for joining today. And if you'd like more information on Maria Villar, some of the links that she talked about in her interview, and also um, other additional resources, you can go to our website at montecarlodata.com and check out our blog. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.